Hello, everyone. I'm really glad to get to be here. Um, as an introduction, so who am I? Um, so I'm from uh, New Zealand originally, born in Wellington, and um, my father is Nati Kahungunu and Tainui, and my mother is the daughter of Rel Welsh and Russian immigrants to New Zealand in the 30s. Um, my family left New Zealand when I was a child with my brother and I, and uh, my parents went to what was at the time BYU Hawaii, uh, or Church College of Hawaii, and has become BYU Hawaii. Um, and we were there for four years and moved to Oregon, where I grew up. Um, I have a, a bachelor's degree in family sciences from BYU Provo and a master's degree um, from uh, in, in a master's degree in change from INSEAD, which is a business school in Singapore, based in Singapore, uh, France, and Abu Dhabi. Um, and those. Uh, I have, I uh, served a Spanish speaking mission uh, to New York City. Um, I came to realize that my experience growing up overseas from New Zealand, uh, I came to realize that there's a, there's a word for that. It's called a third culture kid um, or TCK as they called it. So it's a thing, uh, which is basically where you grow up in another culture of the nationality from which you are from. Um, and so as it turns out as well, um, our children, I have, uh, my husband is Paul and we have three children, um, Joshua, Sasha and Elijah. And we left the US when Elijah was five, uh, five months old. And so they have become third culture kids as well. So um, it's been a, um, we are, by the time we left the US, our youngest was five months old. Um, when we moved to Ireland and we were there for two years in France for five years and then Singapore for five years uh, before coming here, which has been a long standing dream for uh, my husband Paul and I. So since coming here, we formed a coaching and consulting training practice um, and we're just really thrilled to be here. So our, our desires are to have an impact and make a difference. Um, one of the reasons for our topic today is that I have long had a fascination with family dynamics. Um, it's what led me to uh, pursue this field. Um, my fat, I've had a passion for family style, understanding um, family styles, again, dynamics, patterns, um, and the impact that our histories and our family stories, our faka papa, have on us, um, and the things we know, we things we and our life's experience, um, and the impact that that has on us daily. Uh, growing up, I was lucky; I had loving parents. They were imperfect, but they were committed to our well-being in every way, um, and that's something that I've long been very grateful for. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking and watching the grown-ups and trying to understand why there would be arguments, uh, tension, conflict, contention. Um, and I saw patterns that I didn't understand and I didn't, didn't have words for my feelings. And as I grew older, I needed, wanted to understand that. Um, by the time I was 18, I knew I wanted to study psychology. Um, and that helped me understand family dynamics, systems theory, family patterns, and most importantly, that there was even a language to describe the feelings that I had no words for. Um, today, uh, there's so much knowledge and insight out there um, that has made its way into the public discourse that um, I wanted to create, to extract from this knowledge, um, knowledge uh, a framework that would help um, bring give you the class a sense of the research and the conversations that have been created to give us the public tools. Um, and these are tools that would help that help us in our private internal lives. Um, so what I my goal today in our time together in this class, in our virtual time, is to create a space where we can discuss um, and create tools or explore the tools and new ways to process things that are, um, the, to process the complexity of uh, 
past experiences and important relationships. And I, I hope to create a space where you can feel safe to ponder the things, um, the tough things in our lives, the things that we struggle with, sometimes even maybe the things that we don't realize that we struggle with. And so I also want you to be able to feel free to, again, uh, as has been mentioned before, bring up um, any questions. So feel free. So what is emotional intelligence? So in 1995, David Goldman wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. And it, what it is, is an, abilities, an individual's ability to effectively perceive, understand, and manage emotions. It's the power to discriminate between feelings, to label them appropriately, and to use the emotional information you have to gather to guide your thinking and conduct. It's an ability that can be improved through increased awareness and a commitment to change. So we know that life was never meant to be easy. We know life is, has challenges and these challenges are meant to teach us and that our struggles have purpose. Um, and so whether that struggle is constant or whether it comes in waves or seasons, it is something that we all must walk. Um, so to share this, the, the lessons of the butterfly uh, aspect to our class comes from this story, which I thought really beautifully captured um, this notion of struggle and the impact that it has, uh, the place that it has in our lives. So a man spent hours watching a butterfly struggling to emerge from its cocoon. It managed to make a small hole, um, but its body was too, too large for it to get through. And so after a long struggle, this, um, what appeared to be the, the butterfly was exhausted. So the man decided to help the butterfly and took a pair of scissors and he cut it open and releasing the butterfly. Well, the man expected that the butterfly would uh, fly away. But in fact, the butterfly's body was small and crumpled and its wings, it had no ability to fly. The man continued to watch and hoping that it would fly away, um, but nothing happened. And so the butterfly spent the rest of its brief life dragging its shrunken body around, um, shriveled with shriveled wings incapable of flight. So what the man out of his kindness didn't understand and his eagerness to help, was that the tight cocoon and its efforts um, and the efforts that the butterfly has to go through in order to squeeze through this tiny hole was nature's way of training the butterfly and strengthening its wings in preparation for its life to live. Um, Adam and Eve spent, were sent from the Garden of Eden to walk in the terrestrial world to struggle. We will not make it back to God without the lessons learned from the very struggles that make up this life. And so to extend the analogy, uh, our wings can only be strengthened within the struggle and to do anything less denies us of the opportunity to become what we are meant to be. So I created this. This represents our whole self. We have an intellectual life, we have a spiritual life, we have a physical life and an emotional life. And maintaining the balance required to maintain all of these things are what is becomes our whole self. Um, I have, in the preparation for this, it, it has occurred to me that it is truly pure physics that ancient cultures have understood for thousands of years, the notion that good health equals balance and that illness and unhappiness is a reflection of imbalance. Um, Moses 139 says that man is that he might have joy. And so we know that faith and prayer is fundamental to our growth just as education is fundamental to the development of our intellectual life, as exercise is to the development of our physical life. 
Um, in DNC 9336, the glory of God is intelligence, uh, or in other words, light and truth. And all of these aspects are a reflection of it. And then lastly, um, our emotional health and well being is fundamental to the development of our emotional life. And that's what we'll be uh, discussing today. So, why emotional intelligence? It is because our emotions are complex. The words we use matter. Uh, the words we use with ourselves, toward ourselves matter even more. And so our thoughts are made up of words and those words through our thoughts and emotions can derail us or empower us. Because historically, history hasn't done so well with emotions. I thought this was a fabulous um, image to capture, uh, I think, a universal experience that's not so great. And I think it's it reflects our challenges with the human condition, which for many throughout the course of history has just demanded pure survival instincts uh, as people just pushed through. And so we haven't done feelings very well. Uh, maybe you've been told, don't give in to your feelings, push them, you know, as if that was an indulgence. Um, and so while every family has their own experience, their own style, uh, I think for generations, these messages were just to get on with it. But the reality is for much of humanity, only until recent, recent decades, humanity, people just didn't know how. And that this has had a long lasting impact because what we know is often just what we learned at home, that we all come from families um, with different styles, patterns, traumas, and that there is no one right anything. And learning what is yours is and understanding it is part of an emotional intelligence. So as we're going along, I'd like you to think about your own family messages around emotions. Whoops. Were they flexible and open? Were emotions welcomed or was it rigid and closed? How did your family experience or deal with emotions? Because emotions, again, are messy. I loved this image because it shows everything around the outside of this. It shows um, everything that we do, talking, walking, sleeping, every thing in our lives and the connections. Um, and this just reflected a really, uh, it was a great reflection of the messiness. Um, how sometimes we can just feel tied up in knots over all of it. And sometimes our feelings are just all over the place and there's even a map for it. I love this image because it really shows, it, it just literally maps what otherwise feels like a lot of this. Um, and to be able to map this out somehow I think um, brings a lot of calm, um, clarity to a lot of chaos, what feels like a lot of chaos. Up in the top left corner, all the negative emotions that we feel. Being able to articulate with, with, with precision the nature of your feeling has huge value. Going down to the bottom left, being able to uh, explore what it is you're feeling and then over to the top right, all of the positive emotions and then the bottom, uh, bottom right, the cognition, what we're thinking and feeling. Um, so I'm letting us sit on that for a minute. Because even as sometimes it feels that there's no way out, no, no way out, the over, that feeling of being overwhelmed is, is real. And so even sometimes as we just have no idea where to go with it all, how to sort through it, because it's just too hard. There are consequences to shutting down and ignoring our feelings. And so 
what we're exploring today is the ability, pondering the ability to embrace and understand our emotions, that it is an inherent essential part of our emotional and mental health. Because the truth is our emotions are powerful and they're fundamental not only to our, to our physical function, but also in processing our life's experiences because our emotions are connected to real brain processes. Uh, emotional intelligence is built into our brain capacities. So I put this up here to show that our brain stem, which is our very first part of the brain that was developed, is where it says, that's where it says the reptilian brain, that is where our basic instinctual uh, functions begin. And then on top of that grew the, limbic system, which is our basic emotions, the ability to learn and remember. And this allows us to adapt to new environments. And then the next layer is our higher brain functioning is the neocortex. And that's where the ability to choose how we respond to our emotions. That gives us the ability to reflect on our actions and to feel empathy for others. What our emotions do, they, and I, I, I think this is a question we don't often contemplate um, how they serve us. Our emotions can warn us, fear, they give us, they guide us. We have instincts, which are, have been honed for thousands of years. We, they calm us with breath, they inform us. This is also God's gift. And this is how we experience the gift of the Holy Ghost. They deliver the special moments in our lives, our emotions, they're most, they're, they can bring us our most beautiful experiences and our most painful. And they give meaning to our memories because they are part of who we are. Our emotions are the foundations of the, the foundation of the memories that we make. Susan David, who's a psychologist at Harvard said in a book called emotional agility, she wrote in 2013, the way we navigate our inner, our inner world, our everyday thoughts, emotions, and self stories is the single most important determinant of our life success. It drives our actions, careers, relationships, happiness, health, everything. Um, So learning how to navigate our inner world is captured in Plato's words when he said, do thine own work. And this is the work of a lifetime. Uh, our willingness to take on this navigation uh, because I, and it, to, it's a great word I thought, I felt that captures what this is. This navigation is the basis which will form from which we begin our, our work, our emotional work. So navigating landscapes, we have physical landscapes in the way that um, we know the best routes, we know where we need, we buy groceries, go to the post office, go to the bank. We, we understand this notion of landscape as it helps us get from where we are to where we need to be in any given day. We know the roads to avoid, we know the fast route, this, navigation helps us achieve the things we need to do in life and just get stuff done. We also have an emotional landscape and this landscape fills our thoughts and our conscious and unconscious thoughts. It is made up of all of our life's experiences, our traumas and challenges, our unique genetic makeup. Uh, including the messages that we received growing up. We all have these running tapes that we navigate daily, messages that were sent to us that have formed, the, become the basis upon which many of our beliefs, the lens through which we have grown up to see the world has come from some of those earliest messages. So again, what is emotional intelligence? Back to David Goldman, uh, the ability to perceive and understand emotion and the power 
that that gives to discriminating between different feelings, to label them appropriately, and to use your emotional information to gather and guide your thinking and your conduct. And the fact that this can be improved and increased through awareness is a hugely valuable aware, um, insight because the fact is our emotions have a vocabulary. We use it in English right now in this moment. And I think obviously there are filters. Uh, different cultures have different words, obviously, um, for how they express their emotions. Um, I found this incredibly useful and valuable uh, to give us a foundation for how we, you could take any single one of these and pin it back to any single one of these emotions and pin it back to an experience, a feeling, um, an experience in your life where you felt any one of those. And as I'm speaking, I'm, I'd like you to just look through this and, and see if it, you know, does it bring up an image? And it's amazing to me that some of these images, they come up in a, in a split second, and those images are very vivid. The power of our brains and our emotions to capture and hold those memories. It's really uh, incredible to me. So, What does EQ, as in our emotional quotient, is used interchangeably with this notion of emotional intelligence? People with high EQs master their emotions because they understand them and they have an extensive vocabulary of feelings to do so. While many people might describe themselves as feeling bad or emotion, an emotionally high EQ person can pinpoint whether they feel irritable, frustrated, downtrodden, or anxious. The more specific your word choice, the better insight you have into exactly how you were feeling, what caused it, and what you should do about it. I've personally experimented with this over the last few years and you know, in the same way that your emotions as you walk through a day or a week, and there are these things that are just, just hanging there that are just distracting and anxiety provoking. Um, absolutely, I can tell you that the ability to precisely um, identify that thing that's bothering you allows you to just take it and put it up on a shelf. Because, it, and, and this is this notion of emotional intelligence, the ability to step back, and we'll, we'll get to this too, um, and look at it from this thing from all sides and make a determination. Is this something I need to deal with now? Is this urgent now? Or is this something that's just ongoing? Is there something I can do about this now? Yes or no, and if no, the ability to take it and almost create as a third person, put it up on the shelf to be able to just go on with the other things. And the fact that it sits up there on the shelf, it can always be addressed, but you've made a conscious effort and choice to do a thing with that emotion or that issue, whatever is underneath the emotion that drove that, the issue that drove that emotion. So there's something incredibly productive about the ability to become really articulate with your emotional life. Because in the absence of those words, there is frustration, depression, feelings of being blocked, irritable, distracted, unsettled, confused, lost. Those are more words and more articulations to that chaos that sometimes just feels like it's too much. Because unlabeled emotions often go misunderstood, which leads to irrational, regrettable choices and counterproductive actions. And this leads to conflict in our relationships. I love this image. I put this image uh, up because I, I, it shows 
how we sometimes can throw the baby out with the bathwater. And it's, uh, I, I think this is a universe, I feel strongly, this is a very universal thing that we do in the absence of our ability to just get really precise with whatever that struggle or issue is. Because we all have landmines or potholes. I think of landmines as these huge things that blow up or potholes, which are just, you know, distractions along the way. So these are triggers. We all have them. I have this, have had this image of the fact that in truth, we are all masses of energy walking the planet together. We interact, we interrupt, we inform, excite, uplift, we tear down, we hurt, we love, we do all kinds of things to one another. I think as members of the church, one of the beautiful things that I've always uh, appreciated about our gospel is that, you know, with Christ as our guide, um, the example for how to be in this life, in many ways, we are, you know, his guidance helps pull us out of the, the, our very humanness, um, which is what gets triggered all of the time. And so to be able to acknowledge that something, someone, some situation that maybe had nothing to do with You, some emotion within you was triggered that maybe had some, nothing to do with that thing in the moment, but it took you back to something many years before, to a wholly different situation. To be able to put a word to that, these triggers are, are identifiers, um, possibly from experiences many, many years prior. And to be able to make connections uh, in our lives between the now and something that maybe happened generate decades earlier uh, is, uh, or even last week is incredibly powerful because it's those insights that give us control and a language to be able to navigate that inner landscape that historically had, we've had very few roadmaps for. Bradbury, I, I shared an earlier uh, quote from him as well, um, and, uh, said, emotional intelligence affects how we manage, navigate social complexities and make personal decisions to achieve positive results. And so as a next step, I'm gonna share with you next a framework that could be used in any given moment. Um, this is called the ABCDE framework. It's from a book called uh, The EQ Edge and uh, was written by a man named Howard Book and his, his partner Stein, our co-author Stein. So this is an exercise uh, to identify and defuse unproductive belief. Um, so much of this, for example, uh, this would be a useful exercise to be able to do uh, in response to potentially a, uh, this trigger, these triggers that we receive. Um, this could be, an, uh, this is an exercise to be able to take event A, for example, could be one of the triggers. Um, a thing happened and C is the consequence of what happened. What was the reaction? Maybe an interaction between two people. And B is your personal response to what happened. You took it, we would say, you, I took it wrong. I, I took, I responded badly. I didn't mean to. Um, But exploring what that is in B, um, to be able to stop and say, I behaved badly, why? Um, and to be able to look underneath that and go, 
what was my belief? What was the belief that I was holding that carried why did I behave in this way? And often, whether it's a misunderstanding, D is the ability to stop and pull out and go, what was wrong with that? What was I saying to myself? Why was this uh, unhelpful to the situation? What was I reflecting that was actually not represented, that was not about in that moment, but was actually coming from somewhere else. What, and so the debate is the inner dispute that you're doing with yourself to try to question um, what was going on behind that. And then E is the effect of that, what's coming, um, what's behind this. And how did that D E is you looking back at this exchange um, between the 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 where these positive maladaptive were these poorly this poor behavior that I had um, is this a reflection of something that I believe that I intellectually know is not true. Um, at this point, I wanted to ask if there are any questions. Oh, we don't have, I can't, I think you're muted. Sorry about that, I did. I just don't That's want to okay. that noise. Uh, no, of I course. Don't have any questions from the okay. uh, from the, the participants, but is it okay for me to ask one? Of course, absolutely. So, um, from this framework that you're talking about here, is this from just one perspective? This is just the person that is experiencing this event. Is that right? This is an inner process, yes. Okay, and is there, do you, could you give us a, an example of, you know, a typical event that might uh, yeah. like can relate to each of those items in the framework. Sure. So this could be, there's an example in the book that describes uh, people standing around uh, the desk at an airport gate and a flight's been delayed and um, one person comes up uh, whose flight's been delayed so this happened, the same thing happens to everyone. And, and one man just blows up and, you know, just throws all of his attack directly on the person behind the desk. Another person would be, would be able to say, I have the same compromise to my own schedule. Um, but he's recognizing stepping out of his frustration to recognize that she has nothing to do with this. This is just her job. And she is just doing what she, she's just managing the, the chaos. Um, and so, or this could be a, a situation where you're with a, a family member or and trying and have an exchange, um, something blows up because, because of an old, let's say, argue, an argument starts in a family member and you step out of it and reflect what, what that was. So first, just the ability to step out and, and think of A, what was the event? And we could do this for any, what was the last time we had? It could even be someone ringing a, um, a hit and run on your car, let's say. It, it could just be anything that had something with an interaction with a stranger or someone closest to you. Um, um, uh, ulti fundamentally, it would be a misunderstanding. And so the exercise is to, uh, 
look at what happened in that exchange, let's say with your family member and argument, um, and it would be a, a, an internal process. How did I respond? Why did that exchange blow up? And to be able to reflect almost like a rewind and to explore what was happening in that exchange and why did I respond the way that I did? At what point did it, some often we just move on and we just, but the thing is things happen again. It, it, and so often this is where repeating behaviors happen that create um, conflict. And so the ability to stop and be um, like to be able to acknowledge they said something that really triggered, you know, a family member says something that really triggers, let's say, I'm just going to go back here for a minute. In an exchange, you're, you respond in a way that makes you feel distressed, but you don't know why. And to be able to pinpoint that any of these would be when you would plug that back into here. I felt this way. It, um, and that's where in D you're reflecting on the fact that I felt powerless. Why would I feel, why, why? Um, I felt like the bad guy, whatever it was. And to be, so to be able to articulate what that was, allows a greater inform can inform our it's it's the development of the ability to articulate more precisely where our feelings are going um i don't think that completely answered your question but i hope it did a little bit it it, it did um so I think that helped put it in perspective for me. Yeah. I guess the thing that um, when I have, because I, I do this all the time, I have, it makes sense to me really well. My problem is I don't see these things building up uh, and capture them so that when I get to that triggering event, I haven't been able, yes, I haven't been able to do anything. Um, and Anyway, I guess that's what I'm working on personally is recognizing those self-deleting beliefs, self-defeating beliefs or those emotions that seem to build up and it's just a person in the wrong place at the wrong time that gets the explosion. And, exactly. Uh, so anyway, but yes, that was, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you for sharing that. Exactly. Um, just to be able to acknowledge where those triggers are and makes you more capable to be able to avert it. And the things where the places where it really matters is with the most important people in your life to be able to. So I think in, in the church, we absolutely have, I think, uh, a lot of instruction uh teachings to be able to stop and say using our understanding of the gospel you know we have uh christ-like uh examples to guide us but the reality is um and that's that's everything um and so this is this is maybe the first layer at the attempt to go to understand even more deeply um, what's underneath all of that. Um, 
So just to share a little bit about where this is coming from, one of the things that's fascinated with me is me over years is what's out there today. I'm sure you've all heard of Brene Brown. Um, in 2010, she did this incredible TED talk and um, she's a social worker and a researcher. And looking at her, she is just one in a voice of researchers. Um, so the fact that we're, you know, in the public here, uh, having a conversation in the world of academics, all of these researchers are just one among their field working in their specific area. And they've just chosen to go deep. One of the, uh, Howard Gardner, um, in 1983, uh, so let me back up a minute. One of the um, things that, uh, one of the inspirations for me in this whole discussion is the fact that uh, historically, the notion of intelligence has always been attached to intellect. And it's always been very narrow historically. Over the course of our lifetimes, it's been very narrow. And even before, either you're, you know, this notion of smart, not smart, little bit in between, but you know, you have it or you don't kind of a, you know, and this, this makes its way into our popular language, the way we speak to one another in school. And it just has always been a part of uh, our, our, our language. Howard Gardner came in in 1983 and explored this notion of multiple intelligences. So he talked about the idea that people do not just have an intellectual capability or capacity, but have many kinds of intelligence. So musical, and, and these you can recognize in the world, musical intelligence, interpersonal, spatial, visual, linguistic intelligences. Um, and so the reason why I wanted to share this and the reason why I think this is important is because all of this feeds into the emotions that we carry in our lives. Am I smart? Am I not smart? Well, the reality is we're all smart, brilliant, but society has historically only focused on, historically, only focused on very, has been built around a very specific kind of intelligence. And so as an example, um, you know, the exploration of all of these, you know, we could have brilliance in each of these different areas. It just happens that society has always been built this notion of intelligence around, around intellect. But in fact, there is brilliance as we know in our, from our life experiences, just looking at the people who are, because social, because media, the world of entertainment, I think really helps elevate particular people who have really visible skills that um, is a, so musicians, um, athletes, naturalists, um, um, you know, mathematicians, artists, you know, so you can all think of, I just thought of my next slide, uh, page would, would be to include who all those people are, the ones that would be very well known in the world that that actually captured the brilliance of these different kinds of intelligences that he's referring to. So our conversation here is focusing around the so did this is Daniel Goleman um, and his theory. So he's a science journalist and an author. Um, and we've already discussed what that is. And so to me, one of the reasons why I, I want to show the evolution of thought um, that began in, in academia, they, they write these papers, they do this research and that work fil filters from academia into popular culture. That's why Brene Brown's work, and we'll get to that here, was so uh, valuable. So the nature of her work, um, 
as a social worker and researcher, she researches vulnerability as the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness. She explored love and belonging, those who struggle for it and those who don't. What is the difference? Those who believe they're worthy of it are the ones who don't struggle. Those who don't feel love or belonging are the ones who struggle to feel worthy of connection. And this is where the notion of vulnerability, she has taken this notion and just launched it into public discourse. That's why we're talking about it much more commonly today, uh, which is a hugely valuable contribution to society. The notion that uh, vulnerability is the birthplace of joy and creativity, belonging and love. Um, that the willingness and the ability to, uh, to, to go to these places um, is, is, is huge because these fears are universal. And then the last one I wanted to highlight, I referenced her quote before is, is Susan David, who wrote this book called Emotional Agility. And she talks about living an intentional, meaningful life and thriving as one of the most critical skills to develop um, is the ability to take a meta view, which is to say, to go up to the balcony, um, to view from above. So you take uh, your, the, the emotional intelligence we spoke about with the ability to break down um, and put words to your individual emotions. This is uh, another aspect of this, which is to be able to step back and up and out and look, go up to the balcony and to be able to look and take a broader perspective uh, of what makes you sensitive to context. So, so um, it's an ability, an individual's ability to experience their thoughts and emotions and events in a way that doesn't drive them in negative ways, but instead encourages them to reveal the best of themselves. So I think oh, we just have two minutes left, three minutes left. Um, I hope that in our class today, you've been able to reflect on these aspects of your own inner landscape and that hopefully it has helped um, create within you an ability to, to be precise or, or to inspire you to seek to be precise in, in understanding the complexities of your emotions and the ways that uh, your life's experiences, um, you know, this work that we have to do, um, we have many work, we all have many works to do, but in this regard, we have an emotional work, um, whether it's to heal traumas, to, to refine and understand um, the difficulties or, or challenges of life. Um, this, we all have, this is our work. And I pray that you'll be able to, um, as you take it to your heavenly father and as you uh, do your own research in exploring uh, and gaining a greater ability to, our, to find an articulation um, within yourself and your own emotions and the complexities of those emotions and to do honor and respect to uh, the gift that is our life. Um, because uh, we know that it's valuable. We know that God loves us and we do have that as members of the church. And sometimes it comes down to our ability to do as uh, Stephen Robinson said in his book, Believing Christ, um, which is to believe Christ. We can believe in the atonement, but do we believe Christ? And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs>